Hello, everyone. Welcome or welcome back to another episode of The Crossroads. I am your host, Rashida Green, and this is the show for and about environmental justice and those who fight the fight with skin as melanated as the days are long. Knowledge is power, and we are breaking down stereotypes one episode at a time. Today, I am joined by a professor, an engineer, Miss, Mrs. actually, Seema Thomas. Seema, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Rashida, for having me on your show. So as I like to get the show started, and I'll let you I'll obviously give you time to introduce yourself and all that. But before we do and get into that, let's really quickly give some flowers. Do you have anybody in particular that you want to give some flowers to today? I do. I have been thinking about one of my former professors who's no longer here. Uh, She passed away a few years ago. She was one of my professors in urban planning, and she's the first one in a formalized in a class setting, uh, school setting, that exposed us to social inclusion issues, especially in urban areas locally and all around the world. And her name is Mona I'm going to pronounce it incorrectly, but it is Sarah, Sarah Geldin, but we used to just call her Mona, so Mona Sarah Geldin. So I would love to give her flowers today if I could. Okay. I actually have two people. Um, first person is uh, Dr. Charles Drew, and some of you may know who he is already, but he was a surgeon and a doctor and also a professor, um, DC mm-hmm. native, and he was uh, responsible for directing uh, blood plasma programs in the U.S. and in Great Britain during World, World War II. He also attended Dunbar High School, and he oh, was... No. Uh, Mm -hmm. And he was very much so against um, the practices of racial segregation um, when it came Mm. to donating blood during during the the World War. Um, And then I have someone else who I found, too, and I want to raise this person up also is um, Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler. So uh, Rebecca was a former nurse who became the first black woman to receive a an M.D., and I was like, oh. yeah, we got to give her some flowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Talking about pioneering. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's that. those are the two people I want to give some flowers to today. So introduce yourself. Tell the people who you are. So my name is Seema Thomas. I was born in the district but raised in the suburbs around it. I have been living up and down the East Coast. And although I'm technically trained undergrad, at least as an engineer, living in different cities across the East Coast. And you have to remember, this is during the 90s, which was a very different time. I became fascinated with cities and urban areas and what was going on. And it prompted me to study urban planning and policy. And I began looking at all these different dimensions of urban issues. So thinking about water, sanitation, housing, and so forth. And now I am an adjunct professor of urban sustainability at the University of the District of Columbia, which is my father's alma mater. Mm. He graduated in 1974, so it's pretty exciting to be there. And in particular, it's just working with wonderful students as well as a wonderful faculty. They're extremely supportive. And it's a school of second chances, of engaging, encouraging lifelong learning. Uh, and it's it's an affordable option in this area that's so expensive, <laughs> typically. Mm-hmm. And yes. it's just been such a, <laughs> it's been just such a wonderful joy just working with students and being able to share what I've learned in my journey, but also learning from their experience as well. It's been so much of a two way street. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's timely, especially as we're coming up on Earth Day. Yeah. Oh, Let's let's talk about Earth Day because we're probably going to be inside, which is probably what the Earth needs. <laughs> like right, right that is true. Right, <laughs> like, like we the Earth is thanking us, Mother Earth, yeah. <laughs> as like, they see the pollution you down and for all. Staying in the house. <laughs> I appreciate it. <sighs> so, what are you? I know that you you still have your. We're still like you still have students, you're still teaching, you're just doing it virtually. Mm -hmm. So like, are you Mm -hmm. doing anything particular for Earth Day? Or as far as like anything that you've asked the students to do? Is it just like final projects that are related to the subject? Or just like, are you doing anything special or specific? So if we were in session, I mean, in live, in person, we actually, the university was planning quite a few activities for the day, but now it's shifted virtually. And I think in the move to moving online and virtual classroom instruction, those activities have tried to also move as well. It also converges with the end of our 
semester. So Mm -hmm. many papers are due and presentations are due at that time. However, all the subjects that the students are touching on, they're doing a final policy brief. They're all related to Earth Day and issues that affect the Earth. So in their way, they are working and delving into these issues. It would be great to give them a platform later on down the line to share these ideas that they've been developing with a broader audience. But Mm -hmm. for now, we're limited to our classroom, but it doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities outside the classroom later on. That's really great. And, you know, like I talk, obviously, this show is about environmental justice, but I haven't really had an opportunity to kind of get into some of the the nuts and bolts or the mechanics of like what urban sustainability actually is. So Mm -hmm. I was hoping to kind of get into that a little bit today, in addition to like some of the other topics that we've, you know, we've outlined to, to discuss, but wanting to get back into for, to you for a second and ask in mm-hmm. about your experience as an urban planner. So as as someone who has that background, um, how has that shaped your view of, of by being a D.C. resident and like also some of the the issues that D.C. faces from your perspective as an urban planner? It's a great question. Uh, and. I, and as I mentioned earlier, while I was born in the district, I was raised in the suburbs, but the entire area has continued to densify over time. I believe the first thing that struck me, and this is even as far as back as the 90s, is the sense of inequity in the area, the lack of opportunities, and then what we're seeing unfolding in the, in the most recent decades, affordable housing issues that are arising, displacement issues. Uh, and issues related to health, health disparities, right? Um, and that's influenced by food deserts and even the placement of certain infrastructure in the city. But what is also interesting, and I think what has been a change for me, is that it's exciting that people are interested in cities and the health of the city. They're thinking about the urban ecosystem and thinking of alternative ways to live in the city and to live together. So that's exciting. There's been a lot of work on that. And it gives me hope. So I think maybe before I, it was harder to feel hopeful because what were the solutions? And now I feel like because so many people are interested and invested, it's actually uh, created a great atmosphere, a landscape, um, a context to kind of think of these innovative ways to get everyone in the space thriving as well. And even down to the sustainability movement, maybe they focus more on the environmental and economic aspects, but now equity is coming to the forefront as well. And it's uh, it's good. I think it's a positive development. I think DC is going to be confronted with some serious challenges and we can start with displacement, affordable housing. The district naturally because of the height restrictions that it has, and contrary to popular belief, and this I remember sharing with my students, if you're interested in knowing, oftentimes people associate it with this idea that it can't be taller than the Capitol building. Yeah. But there is actually a building in the district that is taller, and that is the National Shrine here in <gasps> Northeast. <laughs> they received an exception. What? And it actually... Re- <laughs> yes. And it, it actually, when you when you do the research, it actually, the height restrictions actually came about in the, the turn of the century in the 1900s um, because firefighters would not be able to go, I don't know, I don't know if that's like five flights. I can't remember exactly what it translates to the number of feet. They were limited by the technology at the time of firefighting. And so that's where these height restrictions orig- originated. Hmm. And then they were reinforced when people tried to go, um, uh, tried to go up and beyond that. But what we're finding is, I mean, and that's just one issue, right? Relate density and thinking how high up you can build. That's that affects the prospect of having affordable housing. I mean, when you look at the numbers, I remember uh, explaining to my students: if you look at downtown rental space in D.C. versus downtown, com- and uh, this is cr- on the commercial side, commercial mm-hmm. rental space in New York City near, near Wall Street. I believe per square foot or per whatever unit um, one was looking at, it is more expensive in DC. Wow. Purely from the fact that you can build skyscrapers in New York City, right? Right. So, you know, and and there have been different, I think Brookings has put out a few papers, this idea of doing gentle density and these really creative ways of, of imp- making these sort of other alternative housing options for a wide range of people to live. And as we are seeing in this pandemic, we all benefit from living next to a wide range of people, right? So if you have some business, you want 
every level at that company to be able to maybe possibly even walk there, right? Because then we could all skip taking public transit and exposing one another. We could we could develop off hours, you know, alternate schedules so we could all enter the building if you know needed and so forth. And so you there are benefits to all of this um, in the long run. And we're seeing that um, unfold during this pandemic displacement um, with that, where people, especially those without as much money or intergenerational wealth are moving out farther and farther away. And we've seen these waves or these patterns historically happen out in Europe, in Paris and London as examples. And it would be sad to see that happen here because you and I, we both know that's not very sustainable. Right. Commuting times are horrible, especially yeah. when a city with this much gridlock, right? Yes. Um, so those are some of the, I mean, those are just, I mean, we can keep going on. We can talk about solid waste and um, and things like we'll that. I mean, there. so many different dimensions. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but I, my overarching takeaway is it's troubling, especially when you think of the equity side. But I do feel very hopeful, especially because so many people are trying to think of advancing in, interesting piloting policies to try to remedy this in some capacity. Hmm. Okay. And like, you know, the th other thing that just from a from an environmentalism perspective, kind of backing away from urban planning for just a second, you know, there's the reason that I make it my business to say at the start of every single show and on every single description of my podcast to say that this show is for people who look like us it's it's really because normally the the image of what an environmentalist looks like doesn't reflect you know the the everybody it doesn't re mm -hmm. reflect inclusion it doesn't reflect equity in any way it just looks like Greta or some white boy as I've said a thousand times like some white boy with dreadlocks and um, Birkenstocks on and that's not true that there there are actually numerous people of color who are contributors who have been consistent contributors to in to environmentalism as a whole not just environmental justice um, but also just like climate change and things of that nature that are more so what we see in the mainstream environmentalist like movement so like one of the things that I wanted to ask you or talk to you a little bit more about are like, how have you seen in your experience, how have you seen that people of color are being shut out of the quote unquote mainstream environmentalist movement? It's it's a great question, what you're asking. And it's something that I think about not just within the environmental sector, but also with others, right, that are all related. So sustainability and transportation engineer, um, energy and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, it's complicated. I think the way I start out with my class, we start talking, we're about to delve into like what happens with the 19th century with conservation and then how it moves to the science of ecology and then thinking about these other factors that ushered in the environmental movement as we mm -hmm. know it today. Right. Look, Rashida, this has been starting if you think about it, at the very beginning with the Native American indigenous population, I mean, we can look here just to the United yep. States, North America, right? And they've been talking about the seventh generation, these principles, I think it was the um, the Native American group was the Iraqua, hopefully I'm pronouncing it correctly. And they've been talking about these issues for how long and how many of them have had, even had a seat or been part of the discussion, okay? Right. They were very much trying to live in harmony with their environment. They saw plants not just as food, but as medicine. Mm -hmm. They've been having, I mean, and not just with that tribe, but of course, all these other groups, right, that um, of the Native American population here and around the world. And you could also argue around the world in developing countries, many of them were by default environmentalists because they had no other choice. Right. Now, bringing it here to the present day, it's it's a challenging situation because at least in today's time, I would say that there, there is a concerted effort to have entry points for a wide range of views, a wide range of profiles, a wide range of identities, or a wide range of ideologies and so forth. The problem, at least from what I see, and this is even thinking about career pathways um, that I've worked on in the past, is that it's great to have entry points, but if you're not having sustained support throughout that, then they're not necessarily getting into leadership roles. And if mm -hmm. then if they're not getting into leadership roles, it's really hard for folks, a wide range of folks, people of color, people with disabilities um, and so forth, to even have a 
word at the table, to have some voice at the table, to set some parts of these agendas, and to also make sure their communities are heard. And and it's for me, I've always thought like kind of thinking a little bit like using Moses as the example of giving a voice to other people who didn't even have a voice, right? Mm -hmm. But I've also realized as part of it, you also need to have somewhat of a bite. And, and I use that word bite because somehow somewhere in there, and I think this is very much connected to the EJ uh, movement, is accountability. And I think mm. that's what the bite is. And having all those pieces there, it's really hard for that to happen. And so what happens is <laughs> it's it's like you can look at our return, return to normalcy council that's out there. It doesn't reflect the diversity of America. And then part of the problem with that is then also the solutions are not as effective because you're not addressing all of those issues that arise. And and one could argue, well, I've read a lot about it, I've studied them, or I really care. But I mean, we both know that there's such a big difference between these lived and learned experiences. And yes. you need all of those perspectives at the table to make good uniform decisions, especially yes. at a variety of levels of leadership. And that I'm, I want to put a pin in that because that kind of goes into a little bit of this, the discussion about the privilege that uh, folks who have, who can have more of the, of the learned experience about uh, people who are in um, underserved or underrepresented communities as opposed to the lived experience. And just being able to participate in those conversations in the first place requires mm -hmm. that you work a standard nine to five job or have some mm -hmm. kind of flexibility in your work hour so that or your work day so that you can attend meetings whenever, whatever time they are scheduled. Sometimes depending on when or with whom you're meeting, you know, for example, mm -hmm. I went to a mobility justice, um, um, it was just a, it was, it was a rally for mobility justice, but really and truly it was a city council meeting in, an, in LA, but it was at the middle of the day and it's like, okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> the only people mm -hmm. who can participate are, we were students, we were students going to this rally. There were folks from the community, but primarily it was lobbyists. Mm -hmm. It was people from the media who have the time and flexibility to attend these events. If you are mm -hmm. someone that doesn't have that, you can't participate. And that kind of, mm -hmm. that's where we talk about like, you know, excludes, ex ex bleh, exclusion of folks who need to be at the table from having an opportunity to be there at all, just based upon, you know, who's making the decisions and, and the their, their lack of concern about everyone and it, equity and inclusion being present and making certain that everyone has the, the a time and a space to speak. So going to, you know, back to your students, like, how are you preparing them to become practitioners? You know, as the, a lot of them are going to be graduating, um, as, and maybe in some who are just going to be continuing their education and continuing on at mm -hmm. BC, how are you, what are you trying to do to kind of prepare them for like what the, what, the, what the world needs, you know, and what they need to be thinking about if they want to come out of this program at UDC and be able to be effective in the world and also, you know, pay their bills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. For me, the first step that I take, and we started off in the first class, is I want them to believe that they are enough. Right here, full stop. Like, they are enough. Their views, their experiences, what they bring to the table, it's enough. And that's your starting point. If you can imagine in, in the classroom, there's a wide range of students, wide range of ages, background, um, varying levels of privilege. We did this privilege walk in class. And we did that too. Some of the, yeah, it's a powerful exercise, right? Yeah. Uh, and some of the students, they feel encumbered to speak. Um, they feel reticent. They, they don't feel, well, their perspective isn't valid or what they don't necessarily know about all these different buzzwords that one might use or it, 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 even, and what I keep trying to remind them is they have a valid viewpoint and if they hold on to it and they continue to share and they continue to listen and be open, that is so important for their careers, especially with whatever dimension that they go in urban sustainability. So I think that's the first thing is just that they are enough because oftentimes 
with underrepresented groups, um, students that are pursuing second chances, it's hard to feel enough or adequate in the workforce. And I mean, the workforce is a hyper competitive space. It's only going to get more competitive as we go into the future. Um, and unfortunately, just seeing what's unfolding right now um, in the job market, the labor market. And so I want them to go in with that belief that, and I want them to feel safe space in the classroom. Uh, the second thing that we do, and this is more from, I guess, an instructional design point of view, and this is, I think, universal to UDC. They'll have someone come in and assess your classes and so forth. I try to make it a combination of collaboration, where they're working with others and in a variety of settings, small group settings to a larger uh, classroom setting uh, where we work on ideas together, but also thinking about innovation. And there's no such thing as a crazy idea because some of these crazy ideas become reality. Yes. And, uh, and we, we talk, like one of the examples that I love, we talk about the circular economy and we go through a biological example and a technical example. In the biological example, we're looking at human feces and what you can do with human feces. In the technical example, we're looking at when you're throwing out that hard drive or, I mean, in, in MRI machines and what can you do with that? And we just walk through all the different steps of the circular economy as a class and concurrently, they have picked something that they waste. I tell them it can be as small as a contact lens. It can be as lame and I say this late like as um it's something I don't, I don't know I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head so <laughs> an iPhone and yeah oh yes right and it, right it's sophisticated or something that seems so expensive right it's an iPhone mm -hmm. and what I love are just the ideas that come from from the class and what they don't realize is this is how great ideas start it's not perfect in the first round no one's idea is perfect but when you keep iterating and you keep working and you keep collaborating that's how you get it and they they've just been so creative with some of their ideas and I hope they take that that skill with them when they go out because I think that will be so important um, going forward especially as we have to be really creative and innovative in the space of urban sustainability and and with that the idea what developing green workforces and that there's a wide range of skills that we need and we even talk about that that's one of the key questions we ask about um, when we're developing this product like what types of uh, what type of labor market do we need? How do we develop and cultivate it? Is there a way that we can bring in people that are not typically part of the workforce or labor market? Right. So we'll think about people that are disabled, that have been formerly incarcerated, um, and just a wide range of skills, right? Even mm -hmm. um, people that can that are in linguistics, right? So there's just a need for a wide range of people to solve these problems. Right. Uh, and then I think uh, the third point I would just say with the classroom, like getting them ready is just encouraging them to keep their ideology about this flexible, consistent, and practical. I think that's going to be important. We see that even with our political discourse, and I think it's relevant even here. And um, and finally, and maybe my students don't appreciate it, but at the end, I give out what I call career nuggets. It may go mm. through one ear and out the other. Look, and the reason why I do this... <laughs> you got to teach the children now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the thing is, so I think for me, what, you know, I, I didn't have parents that were per se, like, out in the field running campaigns. I mean, at our table, when we were sitting down for dinner, it was listen to your elders, respect your elders, do not talk back to elders. Yep. And when... If you think about translating that to a work environment, that's actually a big disservice to you, yes, especially if you've been trained in that model. And while that might work better, you know, in these different community settings and things like that in a, in a work environment, that can hurt you tremendously. I've seen it right. firsthand for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. And if and what I, I never had, I mean, I never had formal instruction on how to be a leader or um, have close proximity growing up to someone who could coach me, guide me, mentor me, advocate for me in that way. I had a village, obviously, which you know tremendously helped me, but those finer points, no one, right? right. No, no one in particular, right? And um, just maybe broad general advice, maybe getting it from a sermon or you know other places. And so what I try to do is, I, obviously, I'm not I'm not an expert in career guidance or pathways, but I try to give them little nuggets that I think are useful and here are other resources and go get it because you have to be your own advocate when you're out there in the workforce. Yes. Yes. I'm so glad to hear you say that. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear you say that because that's so important. And those are like excellent nuggets or gems for the children so that, and I don't mean to call them children like they're babies, but just that's a good 
information for the the people coming up or even if for folks who are reinventing themselves and going back to college or whatever stage of life everyone needs to know that you have to be an advocate for yourself if you want to get ahead you have to no Mm -hmm. one is going to fight for you and your needs like you will so Mm -hmm. just wanting to go back to some of your of your picking your brain about urban planning and just like kind of where we're at right now and focusing on dc Mm You know, when I think about some of the subjects that we talked about in my um, urban sustainability program, um, one of the main ones that one of the first ones we tackled was mobility justice, which is Mm -hmm. kind of an all encompassing and by all encompassing, I'm meaning talking about various modes of of, um, transportation and some of the issues that surround uh, people of color, the poor um, people, folks from the LGBTQ community, just are that is the focus of how we can make that particular aspect of just of our ecosystem of our environment our urban environment make that more just so like in dc and i would like to also kind of bring in this the coronavirus as well um is you know in the the what we're seeing as a a change in ridership and there's two different classes Mm -hmm. and i've talked about this before but just to reiterate there are two different classes of people who utilize public transportation there are people who are what we classify as discretionary meaning that they don't have to take public transportation if they don't need to or don't want to they have a car and they don't that's not their thing or a bicycle that they feel comfortable they don't just some other mode of transportation and folks who are are dependent upon you know, public transportation for their way of getting around. And, you know, there there have been some changes. Obviously, public transportation is still running, it's still going, but it's a change between those who can take it or, or can have the option or flexibility to work from home. Unfortunately, also those who are not working right now and then those that have to use public transportation and are required to get back and forth to work. So, like, from your perspective, I mean – how I guess the first question is, how are we going to what's going to change, do you think, in your opinion? Like, how are we going to ooh, how what kind of precautions are we going to have to take? Do you think there's going to be a marked decrease in, in ridership um, once we're actually allowed to go back outside? Safety is so important, especially when you think of essential workers and getting them from point A to point B. And and I it's interesting, my husband is actually, he has done a lot of modeling for public transit. So it would be great to actually have this discussion with him, but there's actually so much science that goes into estimating how many riders per per train ride, right? That comes on the platform and their estimates and so forth. And maybe in the same way that they think about densities for cities, but maybe it's a similar approach that they take of really trying to optimize ridership in a way that people can have adequate and safe distance from one another, especially for those that are transit dependent. So I would imagine like from, it'll be very data driven, whatever approach that is taken. And so in my mind, I think, okay, I would still be willing to take public transit if I don't have to touch anything. If I don't have to touch anything, that means that I don't go during peak hours. Okay. Mm. If I don't go during peak hours, is there a way I can stand where I don't touch anything? And then, of course, there's the, all the sanitation policies that WMATA has to take forward. But some people don't have that luxury, right? right. And um, and it'll be interesting to see also, and there's this really important relationship between the commercial side and public transit um, in the way that many businesses, the, uh, not just the commercial side, but the, the labor market has really responded to this cri- crisis, allowing people to work from home. If they can allow for sort of um, off-peak arrival and departure from work, that'll mm. also help. Um, so I think it's it's going to be, because these are such interconnected, interdependent factors, right. that it's going to have to take many coming together to solve this, to find ways to make public transit viable. And their budgets have just taken a huge hit right now, right? Yeah. I mean, the loss of income, and then they still need to keep it running. On the flip side, I think they've been able to work on some projects because there's such low ridership that they can get some <laughs> things moving. Right. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, I say that, and I believe 50 workers died, unfortunately, in MTA in New York City. So this is really wow. serious, right? That can't yeah. be taken lightly. Um, and so I think it'll, um, 
I think that there could be a way that um, this is reconfigured to make it feasible, but it's not going to be easy. And I think it's it's going to be ne- driven by data and health, public health concerns. Uh, the other one that I've been thinking about as you brought this up is there's been an initiative regionally, this blessed transformation and working across all the entire metropolitan region of really thinking about bus servicing and getting it more efficient and having more buses arrive. And maybe that needs that needs greater attention because I we're thinking agreed. of metro riding, but what about all our bus riders? And that disproportionately you see many more low income, vulnerable communities taking that. And um, so that will be something that they really have to really pay attention to. It's not just the train ridership, but the buses. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Even where I live, there, you know, um, there's talking or there's talk and there's some development of the rapid transit mm-hmm. where folks can just get on at certain points and just get straight to the metro, which would be beneficial um, because th- it may be more convenient for folks and people may be in closer proximity to buses as opposed to taking the train. Like right. Living near the train has really transformed into more of a luxury Mm -hmm. as opposed to something that the average person can afford to do or has access to. So increasing the bus, the busing Mm -hmm. um, would definitely be a major benefit, I think, to to really helping us to get through uh, to get more folks where they need to go, obviously, but doing it potentially doing a little bit more, um, doing a little bit more safely. Mm -hmm. So. Among other things, other than public transportation, there's always good old fashioned solid waste. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, right? Like there's so much money in that field. So, <laughs> um, so like, so when we're talking about solid waste, we're talking about poop, or that's not just poop, but it's also mm-hmm. like our garbage too, right? Like it's not mm-hmm. just, okay. But when mm-hmm. I was re- when I've researched this, it's been to look at the poop. But this is not just a poop subject. This is just a general like solid waste, mm-hmm. and it and something that has that has come up in the past when I've done um epi- well actually the specific episode episode that I'm thinking of is when I uh, spoke to the ladies from Fulfillery when we were dispelling some myths about zero waste. One of the major myths was that um that really like oh it's all the poor people quote unquote who mm-hmm. are making it so difficult oh if you guys would just learn how to recycle and it that's actually completely false it is actually wealthier people who uh who are actually larger contributors to waste because they have more privilege and opportunity to create waste so like when we're mm-hmm. talking about dc you know some of the the some of the information or the data shows that like even like some wards like ward three for instance has like higher instances of of waste technically because they are it's a more affluent community Mm -hmm. is that correct yeah i mean think like if you think about it maybe um in another in in another ward they're buying one big one liter two liter bottle of soda but if you're going into a more affluent ward well they're buying glass with their perrier (laughs) and it's many bottles because they're taking it with them to work and they're buying three newspapers and they have a subscription to five magazines and they're consuming more and so there's more to recycle or but the the real idea i think behind uh, one key aspect of zero waste when we talk about it in class is really thinking about our consumption habits and really thinking about reducing it altogether right Um, a big part of it i mean while we're all at home COVID 19 i mean we've we've been doing this more so i mean if and it'd be interesting to talk to someone from San Francisco to see how that effort has unfolded there. But if you had to pay per pound for all the waste that you give back to municipality, it would change your habits quite a bit. Quite and a bit. If you, <laughs> quite a bit, right? And it's just amazing <laughs> if you start sorting your trash. I mean, right now we have a special bucket for that that is possibly with COVID-19 stuff on it, right? So we put that there and we keep that like hazardous waste set aside. But other than that, like we're taking all the inside wrappers of things and storing that maybe we can put that with a Trex recycling program that they have at grocery stores. And then you start seeing all the cardboard stuff that we have and you just start breaking it down by category. And there's just a lot of stuff. Yeah. It's, and the thing is, and I've, 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 uh, I may have vaguely mentioned this before about recycling and also even um, at the start of the year, I really was looking into really wanting to have more discussions about zero waste or like maybe not so much zero waste, but just reducing waste mm-hmm. in my life and also giving out information and tips. But 
in the process of so doing, I also uh, had to realize my privilege that, you know, I'm telling people, oh, well, you know, I get up in the morning and then, you know, I, I do have a coffee maker, but girl, I don't use it. And then I pump on down to work and mm -hmm. use the coffee machine there and forgetting that that may not be everybody's, that may not be how everyone's life works mm -hmm. or they may not drink coffee at all because they think right. it's disgusting and I don't trust them. But like the re <laughs> but the reality is, is that that's not everyone's that's not everyone's life. And then on top of that, you know, there is the burden of learning what recycling or what is considered mm -hmm. recyclable and also mm -hmm. putting it in the appropriate place is mm -hmm. a, is extra work on the consumer as opposed mm -hmm. to what should be done, which is putting the pressure on the these companies and these corporations to do the right things to begin with mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting for us to do it. So I've, I've seen, you know, obviously I think I've mentioned this before the McDonald's is actually um, has a plan to um, switch to, I think either it's compostable or re all completely recyclable um, containers for their foods. I think in the next like th four or five years, I, I okay. saw something very briefly okay. that Dove is doing the same thing. Mm. So, you know, and we need, we need it a little faster than that, but like we need these companies to do these things instead of expecting the average person to make the, you know, at home to be, to make those types of decisions mm -hmm. because they don't have a choice. It, I mean, it's a great point you bring up. And I think what we try to do in class is we try to think about transactions, right? Like mm. every little micro decision that has to be made when you're trying to be green. And then if you segment it by different groups, how challenging that is. So let's just use an example of reusable bags that you would use at a grocery store. And, and I'm, I'm saying this in the COVID-19, it's probably preferred to use plastics right now. Yeah. Um, and so for someone who's driving an electric vehicle and they keep five bags in the back of their trunk and then they park in an optimal place because they can be closer to the grocery store and then they take their bags, they grocery shop and they don't have to carry it that far and then they put it in their trunk and they go home. Now, imagine that whole scenario you're carrying your three reusable bags, let's assume, in your bag with your other work stuff and the other stuff left over from work and you're on a bus and you're trying to get maybe from one job to another and oftentimes with buses, sometimes you have to, there's always a transfer involved while you're waiting at the bus station and you just start adding up all of those points, not to mention carrying the stuff. I remember yeah. I lived in an area in New York City that had it was uh, like a food desert and it was such a pain like going up and down the stairs because sometimes the elevator didn't work and mm -hmm. sometimes the escalator was out of commission and it was just such a process. And it's not really easy. The last thing you're thinking about because I have already a hundred other worries to think about are my reusable bags, but then I'm getting dinged when I go to the grocery store. Right. And charged right. for it. Um, and it's just such a gray area with this stuff. And I think solid waste is absolutely one of these gray areas. Um, but there needs to be so much work. And I, I mean, I, I intentionally had a local company, Tenley Town Trash, come and speak to the students. And I think it was so eye-opening, even from some of my students that are less engaged, because they were just talking about stuff that was so relevant to them that every day we're all throwing out junk and stuff everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, many people don't realize those, uh, those, those garbage trucks that you're seeing around. And I mean, when I say this to my students, they just kind of look at me incredulously. It costs about the same as a Lamborghini. I mean, we're, this is not what? a cheap vehicle. Yes. <laughs> and the person that can drive one of those is paid extremely well because they are driving the equivalent of a Lamborghini. I mean, that is no small investment to make for when you're seeing waste management companies, and especially as city, the complete streets are changing kind of how <laughs> these cars can turn, these vehicles can turn here or there. It's actually a very hard job. I mean, think about driving those things through some of the alleys. I mean, I can let alone oh get, God. right, like a little car through, right? <laughs> or even my bicycle when I'm on there, yeah. I'm like maneuvering around the glass and all this other stuff. Imagine a garbage truck, right? And it's so big. Um, in size. And it's a really gray area. And um, and even, I mean, just using plastic bags since we just brought it up. I mean, right now everyone was like, uh, was very much against it. They had stations around the city in the district where they would leave reusable bags so people could use it. And now we're like scouring our own home for all the plastic bags because we <laughs> we donated, I mean, we put it in the Trex recycling bin or mm -hmm. donated it elsewhere. And now that's like a premium, the right premium item yeah. to have. And, and it's like that. I mean, with when we're doing the waste sort now at home and we're really thinking about everything, I take a contact lens and that's something and you never want to put in the water supply, flush it down the toilet. But this is like this little teeny tiny microplastic. Like, what do you do with it? And fortunately, I had the time to Google it to find places to dispose of it. 
and then you think about something like floss. What do you do with floss? How do you reuse that to the very you end? You get vegan right? and, floss. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> with my daughter, what we've been doing, having we, we wash it, dry it out, and then we turn it into cereal bracelets. So we can put cereal through it and then bite on it. Um, what? Just trying to find. Yeah. Remember those like Lucky Charms that you would yes. uh, the necklaces? Yeah. Oh, my <laughs> so, God. <laughs> Yeah. Just trying to push it to the end, you know, I mean, and this is what communities, especially those that were struggling did, they were so creative with mm-hmm. everything down to its last drop. I think of my grandmother, who would use something to its very end, because and both my parents, they grew up on farms, you know, in the ag sector, you owned your trash, there was no company coming up and picking up the stuff, you dug a hole, and you put it there if you really couldn't use it. So it was the bare minimum that went in there. And you found a way to the very end, mm-hmm. you wrap things in newspaper, um, because they would degrade, right? Yep. Um, so, um, yeah, so it, it's a very gray area and I hope more people consider going into those areas because there's so much innovation needed. Yeah. And you know, when we're, I'm just, I'm, so, I'm still stuck on, <laughs> I'm still stuck on you making bracelets. Oh what, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I never thought about doing that. That's just, <laughs> and that's so creative. Like some things that I've started doing, um, is actually just kind of, uh, reusing glass jars, um, like, you know, mm. old spaghetti. Jar. I'm not going to, f- and that's a story in itself, which I may or may not tell, but like <laughs> I, <laughs> share, um, share. <laughs> oh God. Oh, okay. All right. So I mean, I am using glass jars. I am using them for water and only using them for myself. I'm not serving mm-hmm. them to other people. So I was doing an event and a lot of things will come out of this story, but I was doing an event and it was, in a very hippie part of Maryland that I shall not name. And, <laughs> um, but I was the face of it. And I was having folks come and speak about, about mass incarceration and, you know, what citizens can do to, you know, be at the forefront of these issues, be knowledgeable, but also like use their, their privilege if they have it to affect change. So we had food. And someone offered one, they made a big deal about wanting to make sure that we were having quote unquote green um, practices. So using Mm. either compostable or reusable silverware. And I said, that is fine. We can do that. So I get a phone call saying, hey, um, so I went to go pick up some glasses, drinking glasses from someone's house. They are... um, basically old spaghetti jars and old salsa jars with the labels still on them. I thought I would ask you what you thought about this before we whip these out at the event. Now that part she didn't say that's (laughs) ad living. So my response was, um, absolutely not. Mm. And then I had to subsequently go to my car and pray with one of my friends because I was so (laughs) angry and the mm-hmm. reason that I was angry and this is where the the the, mm-hmm. the race piece comes in mm-hmm. is that all I could hear was people looking at me and saying mm-hmm. now I know your mother taught you better than that mm-hmm. even mm-hmm. if you had to go down to the dollar store girl and mm-hmm. get yourself some you know <laughs> flat whatever get mm-hmm. yourself some cups you could have done mm-hmm. it you could have hit it mm-hmm. with the frat house style and got red plastic cups if you mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. fact that you were going to do you know and it was and i when i vented about it and to get it off my chest i could calm down it was more about the fact that it's about the the optics of it that people are mm-hmm. not going to look at this as you're being green or sustainable they're going to think that you mm-hmm. don't have appropriate cleaning habits mm-hmm. and that or respect is not a, or respect and that is not associated with the with the with the Rashida Green brand <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> not mm-hmm, up in mm-hmm. here yeah and no, so absolutely. like so when we were talking a little bit earlier about privilege this is where this is kind of the nuance that like little I'm rubbing my fingers together that the kind of like nuance piece about it where it seems mm-hmm. like some of the practices that folks have or would want to have or would encourage others to have mm-hmm. rub against Either A, their mm-hmm. ability to do it, you know, like uh, the ability to, for instance, for instance, composting. Not mm-hmm. everybody has the infrastructure to compost. Now, I just throw mine in the woods sometimes, but I don't, <laughs> not everybody mm-hmm. has that luxury. <laughs> they can't just, yeah, yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying? Like if they're in an apartment, mm-hmm. you may not have the space to have one of those bins mm-hmm. that's enclosed that you can keep it in. So this is one of those like, you know, areas I feel where the, where sustainability 
and I would say social norms mm-hmm. by race mm-hmm. kind of come mm-hmm. together. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. absolutely. I mean, let's let's just take the district in the 90s, taking the bus and riding a bicycle. I mean, I would say there could be even a stigma against it, right? That it right. wasn't yes. considered. Yes. It wasn't considered on, like as a show for moving on up. It might have been cheaper, more green, <laughs> all these other things. Right. And um, and. <clears throat> I, and I think you can look, I mean, we've joked about this example before, but if you were to go to a lunch professional meeting with your colleagues and you bring Tupperware to take your doggy, your leftovers from mm-hmm. lunch, it just, it would not look professional and they wouldn't necessarily right. at your next review say, Rashid, I really like that green move. I'm going to promote you. I mean, it's just, yeah, no. <laughs> I mean, it, it could be seen as a ding, right? Especially if I'm thinking of putting Rashida in front of a client, uh, what is she going to do? Right. And right. Um, absolutely. I think stigma, um, culture, who gets to define when it's appropriate, who gets to define when it's in, all of those play a big role. And that's why I go back to this theme. We need everyone at the table when we're making these policies. Right. See, I like what you did there. (laughs) (laughs) You brought it all together. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's just because I see it too often in many different different contexts uh, when these decisions are being made or ideas. And... You have people that have this learned experience, but not people who have this lived experience who've seen stigma or bullying or all these other things that come up from these things. And um, I mean, when I was growing up, you know, I'm a girl of the 90s. It was cool to have a car with booming bass. That was Mm -hmm. no one was no one. I mean, the idea of maybe a bicycle and a big stereo system going around. I don't know if that got you that many cool points. Um, So (laughs) there was a a big I mean, if you think about it, there was a cultural leaning at the time towards having a great car as opposed to thinking about what you could do on a bicycle. And and much of that, you know, there's been a shift where people are really rethinking it. Um, Even I've seen in many parks around the area, they have um, skateboarding parks and you see people on skateboards and scooters and wide multimodal approaches. But this is all very current and it's it's a great place to be to explore these things. But again, when you think about the circulator as an example, Mm -hmm. it costs a dollar high frequency it's going connecting different parts of the city quickly i mean it's convenient to take the circulator you can just wait there and it's going to come up and then you can get a discount if you just got off the metro Mm -hmm. but when you're taking other bus lines it's much much harder in the city and oftentimes like if you're if you're trying to connect from two different parts you know two different quadrants of the city it's more expensive it takes a lot more time and sometimes there are even safety issues as well Mm -hmm. and um and so you just think about that, and and fortunately the region is moving towards taking that circulator approach and hopefully applying it elsewhere. My fear is what lines are they going to cut, and who's going to hurt when they cut those lines when they go to high right. frequency approaches. Right, and that's really the main thing that I think you know. Even like when you and I were talking before about just like this whole the the area that we're or the space that we're in with the coronavirus, really you know things like this expose vulnerabilities in our mm-hmm. community, mm-hmm. and with that same token when there's any type of new innovation or changes um even in, in within a, a community or a city it usually impacts or completely ignores the most vulnerable mm-hmm. and even with the the I, I believe in dc are they they still they have the um what is that thing the thingy the trolley mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like I know it's limited right now, but that could potentially be like it is in in other cities like New Orleans and um, that are in San Francisco, too, where that could be another opportunity for transit. But like, where is that going to go? Is that going to go Mm -hmm. into the into, you know, some of these underserved communities where it could be impactful or is it only going to be for tourism? Is it only going to be to highlight or make the live or alleviate any kind of issues for the, the lives of folks who don't really need any more leisure. It's interesting you bring up the trolley because I can't remember, I wish I could find the study for you, but there was a study I remember reading where possibly trolleys, bike lanes, they increase the home value in the area. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And just because we started off the conversation thinking about affordable housing and displacement, it's we're in this really weird space where when you try to do something good, I mean, I I remember Whole Foods coming into the Logan Circle area and just slowly the the values of the homes just started creeping up, creeping mm-hmm. up. And there's this, this, 
phenomena that when you're when you're making areas more sustainable or improving them by adding groceries or you know um, imp- you know reducing the food desert vacation um, rate that you do this other thing where you make it so desirable to live and home values are going up that you displace people at the same time and right there and there are people that are working on this i think representative white is actively working on this on a committee um folks and different think tanks around the city are thinking about it and i think maybe cities like denver have really been piloting different ideas but we've really got to figure this out because as you said like it's great to have this idea of like linkages and things like that but what are the under unintended consequences that happen and who does it ultimately help in the end right and you know one last thing that i wanted maybe not the last thing but one thing i wanted to ask as well as we're talking about um kind of going to the going back to sustainability is that there's it's a lot of misconceptions about what it is like so when my fr- one of my friends um, asked me what it was like she had no idea what I was talking about she's like mm-hmm. girl do people even care about this I was like yes girl people <laughs> care about this what are you talking yeah. about and she's like well what a-? she just asked me something random like she wants me to talk about littering and I, I told her I would <laughs> I, I was like I'll talk about littering girl she's like okay but you know what are some of like the common in your opinion from your perspective what from your students from when folks ask you what that means to you mm-hmm. or whatever what are some of the common misconceptions that you hear about sustainability so i think the first one i think that is perhaps most common and i'll, I'll probably talk about three the first one is that it's just equal to environmental issues right sustainability mm-hmm. concerns equals environmental con- uh, concerns and what i really like about the evolution and actually if you actually this connects to earth day you, you could say earth day was the um the opening the it, it began this great decade of a lot of great environmental legislation where we're yes, thinking about clean air, clean water, protecting mm-hmm. animals, um, brown fields, you know, devastated landscapes. And then there was pushback, right, that came after that in the 80s. They're like, oh, this is too much progress. Let's regress or find a way, right? Yeah. And sometimes I wonder if that's what's happening now, but that's another it's conversation. exactly what's uh, happening now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, I, and then you start seeing these ideas about sustainability emerge, and it makes sense where you have people coining the phrase, um, think globally, act locally, and this idea that, look, environmental is absolutely important, but there are two other really important components, thinking about the economic aspects and the people, the social, the equity. And when I think about sustainability, it's really that triad that's so important to keep in mind that, and it's thinking about, if you think about a Venn diagram, it's the intersection of all those areas. And then you know, these these interesting relationships between all of these other components. And when we think about sustainability, it goes back to this the Native American belief. It's like, look, we have limited resources on this earth. How do we continue to endure, go beyond, right? Not just this generation, but for those to come. And I think Native Americans, they were really, I mean, when I think about it, they were thinking 140 years ahead. I mean, yeah. it depends on how long each person lives, but seven generations generations. And I mean, that's amazing. And they were doing it since back when. And this idea in sustainability of really just trying to connect ourselves with nature and the environment and that we're all interrelated, that we need to all do this together is so important. And it's uh, and just thinking about going back to one of your points of um, there have been a lot of people of color in the space, right? So you have Native Americans, you have George Washington Carver, right? Yeah. I mean, um, and maybe they don't necessarily make the headlines and things like that in present day, but these people are really instrumental just as much as Rachel Carson and things like that. So, mm-hmm. um, so it's very much, it's, it's not that it isn't about the environmental movement, but it's so much more. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. And now when you have multilateral organizations and countries signing up for sustainable development goals and really having very specific targets from all these different aspects, thinking about hunger, about poverty and the importance, because if you have hungry people, they're they're not going, you just, you can't think that far into the future. You need to eat for today. And right. if it means cutting down this tree and, and it, you know, as part of a very important ecosystem, you're going to do it if that means your family can live till tomorrow. And, right. and if we can all help each other and work together, then maybe we can figure this out. And I think that's one of the most amazing things, bringing all these countries together, working on these issues, um, because it's, it's, and it's amazing to see in the pandemic, the importance of working together and learning from one another. And mm-hmm. there are so many lessons to take from COVID-19 that will be very important for the upcoming crises that the planet earth will face um and especially leadership and this idea of interconnectedness and learning from one another and doing things together for me i think the the biggest misconception is just that 
um, like you said, like confusing sustainability with environmentalism, Mm -hmm. but also just sort of thinking, well, I don't know how that applies to me or thinking that it's just about recycling Mm -hmm. or just about Mm -hmm. saving the whales. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we do need to save the damn whales, but we have to save every other part of the whales ecosystem too. We can't Mm -hmm. (laughs) just, it's not just saving the damn whales. It's saving all the animals that, you know, that the dolphin, not the animals, but that's microorganisms that the, the whales eat. It's saving, you know, the, the other animals in the, in the ocean that need photosynthetic life Mm -hmm. in order to live. Like it's all of those things Mm -hmm. connected together. And I think that that's the piece that I think Mm -hmm. people don't realize, or they don't think it's necessarily a, a black experience or a person of color Mm -hmm. experience Mm -hmm. because of just to be frank, the, the flat out whitewashing of the, the mainstream environmental movement. So I just wanted to, To, yeah. Yeah. And to add (laughs) another point to that. And this, I mean, And this I've seen sort of in the discourse, I think what happens a little bit with the environmental movement is there's this like panic, mayday, mayday, this stuff is about to happen, right, to the polar bear and all these other entities. Meanwhile, you have other movements going on, the Black Lives Movement, where you're just trying, you're just trying to go for a walk. You're just trying to do something as part of your day and your life is threatened. It's, it's harder. It's, you you can't even think about these other issues because these other issues are so pressing day to day. And yes, and I think if there isn't discussion and dialogue across the table, we're just never going to be able to work on these problems together. And because people of color do have to be worried, look, food security, water crises, all of these things. I mean, when you sanitation, especially in developing countries, hits Mm -hmm. people of color the hardest in slums. And I'm so worried about what, you know, could unfold in India. And I mean, I think there was, I remember a statistic sharing with my students, I believe in Kenya, 95% of urban fecal sludge is not even treated and it goes back into this sort of urban ecosystem and that's dangerous right that's how you get cholera and diarrhea and stunting and kids don't grow and so it does affect us but i think among this myriad of concerns and if you finite that you can only worry about then yeah it moves to the back burner you'll get to it when you can right and i think that's just what you were saying before about um you know sorry my Apologies, my dog is trying to oh. come up here and, <laughs> no, and join I'm the like, conversation. No, girl, I'm talking. <laughs> Your mother is making points. Um, <laughs> but it's all. Jesus. But it's um. But it's all. It's it's what you were saying before about if if I cut down this tree today, I can eat today. I don't have time to worry about tomorrow. But the problem is, in addition to thinking about the fact that a black man can't be in his own house, right, or can't walk into his own house without being shot and killed. Or the fact that a black man can't say, hello, I have a concealed weapon that I am, I'm licensed to carry and still being shot and killed in his own vehicle. We do have to, those do need our attention. But what mm-hmm. also needs attention in our communities as well is the fact that there are incinerators in our communities mm-hmm. that, that children are, we are our children, African-American children, have higher instances of lead in their system or lead in their blood than white children do. Like we have to be mm-hmm. able, we have to, two things can happen at the same time. And we're going to have to kind of ratchet up that ability to focus on more than a multiple issues because there are multiple things that are affecting us. Like one of the things that I've been very vocal about in the last um, few weeks or definitely last few days was the comments made about, you know, African-Americans and pre-existing conditions and the the subtle, not so subtle, but maybe to some subtle um, dismissiveness and of the of that of the mm-hmm. health concerns of heart disease and all these things as oh well this is why it's so high it's because of this mm-hmm. as opposed to getting to the root of the issues which is out and out all day long racism mm-hmm. that it's there is no other way to, to to describe that other than by calling it by its name and then on top of that for the surgeon general who I don't know. He looks like Grant Hill. Anyway, the Surgeon General making the comment about, you know, a stepping up, which is a very common, you know, I would cite Bill Cosby's pound cake speech as another mm-hmm. example of just this this discourse of, oh, well, if you all would just tighten up a little bit, then things would just improve, which is mm-hmm. not true. And it has never been true ever at all. And And it's like, you know, and we have to be. 
And this is why it is important for us to be knowledgeable and aware, not just as black people, I would say as people of color in general as well, but like why we have to be cognizant of the issues in our community, which that relate to the environment, because they are going to be used as justifications for why our other issues that we are facing or encountering, th- that these are the reasons why you're like this. Well, you're all, you all have heart disease because you eat fat burger every day. So as opposed to the real issue, which is fat burger is closer to my house than Whole Foods and less mm-hmm, expensive. Mm-hmm. So how am mm-hmm. I going to feed my family with, with $20 at Whole Foods? Do you know how much the the, raw, the hot bar is? Mm-hmm. You, can't feed, you can't feed kids with $20 at, at Whole Foods mm-hmm. unless you're buying them cookies. So how am I going to help myself or help my improve my health if I don't have access to the things I need to get myself together? There is a great Brazilian phrase that my friend told me about. It's don't point your dirty finger at me. Mm-hmm. Listen, I mean... When this first erupted, going to COVID-19 and having just sort of general discussions with uh, with others in the district, when I, I was concerned and look, I mean, the numbers, and even though it's in East Asia, we're an interconnected world and also just for the people in Asia as well, right? And they said, yes. well, you know, th- those are vulnerable populations, the, the um, older people, or it's mostly men, they were smokers for some time. Yes. Okay, well, so, like, there are many reasons why people smoke. And as we know, as we were kicking out the tobacco industry here, they just moved and expanded abroad. And they realized, wait a minute, you know what, forget the United States, there are billions <laughs> of people out here. I mean, you look at the smoking rates in many developing countries. Yeah. So and those are, I mean, maybe their original headquarters were in the United States, some of those companies. So okay, well, let's just dismiss that as being an issue um, or of concern. And then, oh, it's just the elderly. And then suddenly when you start, you know, there's a child that died in Illinois. And th- suddenly when it real, you realize that, oh, no, it's not just limited to these demographic groups. It could be anyone affected. It's suddenly, it's suddenly more um, palpable, more, um, it, it could be me, right? It, it, the story changes. And I think when, seeing what's unfolded here in the United States of how it's just disproportionately hurt um, black communities, other communities, I agree that it exposed, but it's also reinforcing uh, many of those vulnerabilities that are in the system. And it's sad that people are not waking up and seeing like, wow, these are these are situations that should have been corrected a long time ago, uh, a long time ago. Yes. And because, it, I mean, I believe one or two weeks ago, it was Black Maternal Health Week. Mm-hmm. That should not exist in this country. I mean, there shouldn't be disparities like that at all. Right. And and these are, um, especially in this country that has such phenomenal health care, such innovation in the health field, incredible scientists working, that just should not be an issue. And it is. And to me, that's what it tells me is that, wow, like despite all these advances going to the moon, doing all these other incredible things. Wow. Like these inequities are still not corrected. And again, going back to that Brazilian phrase of, you know, pointing the dirty finger at others is just completely inappropriate. I think of stories like Henrietta Lacks, the syphilis testing down in Tuskegee. Um, There's so many, it's not just about these pre-existing quote unquote conditions. There's also serious distrust of the medical community for valid reasons that have been validated. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that it's all converging right now, and it's just made a horrible situation even more dire. And and hopefully it's a wake up call to others. They're like, wait a minute, you know, we how can we contribute to the solution rather than just point or just say like, oh, well, you know, that was pre existing or whatever term that they want to use. Right. Um, and I think it's just it's always really, you know, it's it's interesting how when it's not affecting the majority, it's not as pressing of a concern. You just sort of look from abroad and just uh, from afar and just watch. And Mm -hmm. that's not, and we're seeing that now you people, we cannot do that. We are all interconnected. And if anything about this upcoming 50th anniversary of Earth Day is talking about, we are more interconnected than we have ever been. And I mean, I tell this to my students all the time. Like when we when we talk about bike lanes or we talk about elevator access at public transit facilities, there are spillover benefits to everyone. Bike lanes are wonderful for the hard of hearing community. Uh, when you think about elevators, mothers, caretakers, pushing strollers, we all benefit, right? And mm-hmm. if you can if you can think of, I mean, or encourage other people that when we take care of others, we also benefit. It, 
just broadly, it's, I, but I just, I don't know that messaging is not there. I don't know if it's because it's not tied to money yet or yeah. that, um, and that's, you know, that's making those linkages and let's work on it, folks, if that's what needs to be done and find, uh, and find creative ways to do it. So we have more than come to the crossroads and we've talked about a myriad of things from transportation to housing um, and, and really health, what's going on right now, plastic and e-waste, um, solid waste, and just all of these important subjects and topics. But what I want to do is ask if there are, I want to do a couple things. First, I want to plug a book that was very helpful called Losing Ground, which mm. covers the different waves mm. of the environmental movement. It has a special, not a special, but it has a pretty descriptive, um, it's very descriptive and it, and it talks in depth about um, Earth Day, which we've talked about and touched on a few times during our conversation. And second, just to, to say or ask you, um, what are some things that, you know, folks can do? You know, we're all in the house. We have a little more free time than we care to have mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, staring at our partners and kids and dogs and stuff. And like, <laughs> like what binge watching, and binge watching Tiger King and making TikToks and such like, but what are some things I'm not doing that, by the way. But anyway, what are some things that we, have that we can do or people can do to kind of like to be more effective and, and not mm -hmm. necessarily talking about like, well, you reuse your spaghetti jaws, but mm -hmm. like what, but, but what, but if that's the, an if that's an answer, then let's that, let that be an answer. But you know, what can people do? Yeah. No, I think this is a great question. It's something that I've very much uh, been thinking about, especially as ways to not think about what's going on. Uh, I mean, it's sort of the new saturation after a certain point started giving me tension headaches, I think. Um, <laughs> and, uh, so I think the first one, what I think is really exciting, a trend, I don't know if you've observed it, is people have been buying seeds and seeds of all types yes. and taking yes, seeds from the leftovers. Look, there's a ton of great videos, YouTubes. I mean, my daughter, she in particular is interested in the, I think it's BuzzFeed Nifty, where they show you how to quickly take your leftover scraps and grow more vegetables or fruits yeah. from them. Um, Look, this is, I mean, urban ag used to exist. I mean, this, when I say used to, it, it does exist. It's just, there, it should be, I mean, we, all of us should be thinking about it. And in particular, I definitely should. I, I mean, I must confess that I don't have a green thumb. My dad does. My mom Me is a botanist. My, <laughs> my, both my grandparents, like on both sides of my grandparents, they're far farmers, right? So it's just, I feel like, and I've gone the other route going completely urban. <laughs> Like, let's um, plan. Right. <laughs> exactly. I was like, oh, I don't want a country life. I want to go, right? Yeah. And I mean, this is such a great time. And it, hopefully, as we're thinking about these uh, local food secure, I mean, food, local food sources and things like that, and hopefully in the next evolution phase, we'll really think about growing food closer to home uh, and maybe even changing zoning laws around this so you can grow food. You could have a yard in, right? A garden and a yard together yes. and edible landscapes. And UDC is at the forefront of this. I mean, they have a phenomenal urban ag uh, approach and they're just, I mean, if you can imagine, I think over the last five years, they've grown 40 tons of food on their rooftops and their wow. um, different hubs and things like that. And they have a pantry as well. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, so that's one thing. Think about urban ag. If you have other loved ones and younger ones or people that are interested in learning, I really encourage people to do a waste sort. I mean, the D.C. government does this as well. Every few years will go through and they will put on the gloves and they will look and sift through the trash and just see what is there. Because you'd be surprised in this time when, when you know that you might not be able to get this next shipment of X, Y, Z, either you're going to have to learn how to stretch stuff or make, um, you know, or wait, right? And I mean, we wanted to make flashcards for my daughter. We were taking, we were cutting up cardboard, which could ultimately be recycled, but really thinking about reusing something till its very end seems so appropriate now because things are not as readily available as they once were. Um, so that's uh, the two things. And then the third thing, and this is just so complicated, um, and I, it's not something one maybe can do right now, but it'll be interesting to see. And it's for people to start collecting thoughts and journaling the importance of green space um, and having close access to it. So even thinking about your park, dreaming about your park, writing about your park, I think it's important to journal it because it's such a lost opportunity not being able to be out. And I think when you look at what happened in the 1918 Spanish flu and they did some comparative analysis between different cities, the people that recovered the fastest um, 
and better uh, were those that were exposed to fresh, clean air and out in the sun. And we're leading these lives in, that are very indoors right now. And even when we go back to whatever the new state of normalcy is, we're pretty much indoors. I mean, this is the first time I've seen so many birds and I've paid attention to it because I've never spent this much time at home. And uh, I would just highly encourage people to pay attention. That's what Rachel Carson did. She, before she wrote her groundbreaking book, Silent Spring, she was noticing that there were no birds that were coming out in spring because all we just relied on all these pesticides and pollutants and they were killing these species. And then she begged, asked the question, could this happen to us too? And people started paying attention. Seema, thank you so much for joining me today. Do you have any any shout outs that you want to give? Do you want to give folks um, your, your social media so they can follow you? Oh, yes. So I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Seema P. Thomas, and that's S-E-E-M-A. And I would love to give a shout out to the UDC faculty in causes. It's a college of agriculture, urban sustainability, and environmental sciences. They're just such a phenomenal group to work with. That's great. And I actually want to give a shout out to the entire UDC class of 2020 that's getting ready to graduate, you know, who will not be able to to walk, but hopefully they'll have some kind of awesome ceremony or something so that all the students know what an, what an excellent accomplishment. And that's actually like a general shout out to to all mm-hmm. of the class of 2020, mm-hmm. all the kids, students um, in high school, students in college. Heck, even if you're graduated from the sixth grade, all of you. Congratulations. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so sorry that you all won't be able to have the formal, you know, ceremony, but know that you, you, what you have done and what you're persevering right now is an accomplishment. I just wanted to, to say that too. But Seema, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. This was such a great conversation. Thank you. I love this conversation too. And I hope we have more. Oh, we're going to have more. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you so much.